All right, the cameraman says we're ready to go. So, um, thanks, Rob. So, uh, welcome to the 165th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Uh, tonight, we are going to be hearing from Julian Berman, who will be reviewing his real world, uh, real world experience with uh, going from Python 2 to Python 3. Uh, tonight, before we get started, three quick requests. We make this uh, every month. One, please silence your cell phones, put it on buzz, whatever, or make it quiet enough that it's not going to disturb anyone if it goes off. Two, please do not use the coffee maker. The grind uh, is very noisy and disturbs the entire uh, uh, room. And uh, three, if you have questions, and we'll do questions at the end, please uh, wait for the mic. I'm going to come around and try to give everyone a uh, uh, the mic so they can ask the questions, be heard. Uh, if not, please make sure that, that Julian uh, repeats your question so it's there for posterity. Uh, we'd also like to quickly thank Google for graciously uh, allowing us to use this great space. And uh, thanks to our other sponsors, uh, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. Uh, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers. We want to thank them. They've contributed greatly over the years and continue to do so. Um, tonight, after Julian's talk, we will be giving away some O'Reilly ebook coupons as well as these two massive tomes, the uh, Programming Python books here, the uh, Big Snake book. Uh, to win, you will need to answer trivia questions that Julian will be asking. You know, key point here, the trivia questions will be from the talk, so pay attention. And when it comes time, raise your hand. I will try to be as fair as I can in, the f in getting the mic to the first person whose hand I see going up. Whoever gets the mic and gets the right answer is the person who gets the book. Shouting out the answers only leads to tears. Um, after the meeting, we encourage folks to join us for more talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub at 250 West 14th Street. Uh, you don't have to write that down. We will have a couple of groups heading over and leading you there, so you can just uh, glom on and go down at your own pace. Uh, we have a reservation in the back, and the volume is going to be lowered so people can talk. It's not going to be um, super loud in there in the back area. Um, a few quick announcements. So we have some exciting news. This is going to be an unusual month coming up. Um, we have two presentations. Our regularly scheduled monthly presentation on March 14th will cover open source private cloud frameworks and we'll have speakers representing all three leading frameworks. In addition, we are honored to be hosting Stefano Zaccar uh, oh my goodness, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Zaccaroli, the Debian project leader who will be giving us an overview of Debian on a special meeting on March 20th. Both meetings will be on Meetup, and RSVP will open two weeks prior to each event. Please RSVP, um, if you're interested, yep. Uh, one of our workshop coordinators, Rob, Rob, do you, uh, you had a, a thing? Ah, there you go. Uh, here. So good evening, everybody. Um, quick announcement. Our next workshop will be uh, two Tuesdays from now, the CE26, correct? Um, at our workshops, we will have um, we have volunteers that will be doing um, beginning Linux. Oh, this went off. Hello. Okay. Uh, beginning Linux system administration and hardware hacking with Raspberry Pi. So, if you're interested, we're also on we're also on meetup.com. So, you come in RSVP and just come join us on the 26th. Back to you, Peter. I'm sorry about that. So, does anyone have any other announcements? Uh, anything going on? Um, all right, well, uh, in that, no announcements, really? Okay, this is the first. Um, well, okay, someone closing? Well, all right, well, then we'll, we'll talk about it again next time if you want to. Yeah, So there's the idea that maybe we could uh, find some people to help sponsor a Summer of Code project. We could look into that. I don't know. I don't know what my work schedule is like, but uh, this close. So we're almost there. Um, there's just a lot of work to finish up to tidy that up and get it done. But yes, we're pretty much. Um, all right. Well, in that case, uh, let's give a, a warm round of applause to Julian for coming out on a day like this and suffering the wrath of uh, any potential relations. <laughs>
Well, it's all right. So, uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Python 2 and Python 3 and migrating back and forth between them. Um, I should say, uh, first of all, that there's basically uh, three things to talk about here. Um, those three things take up uh, longer than an hour. Uh, so we're, we're going to try to kind of guide things based on um, what fits. Uh, essentially, uh, there's tons of uh, new features and new goodies to talk about, uh, so we can talk a little bit about, a little bit about that. Um, right now, uh, Python, uh, essentially, uh, the current versions is 2.7, uh, which is what everyone's using, and um, Python 3. Uh, is the new shiny thing. Um, you know, just give me one minute here. See if get this working. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so we can talk a little bit about the new features. Uh, there's also, obviously, things that are coming in Python 3.4, which is the next version. Uh, but, but the middle thing here um, is that the whole subject of migrating to Python 3 is kind of really a uh, touchy thing. It has been for the past couple of years. Uh, and there's at least one reason, uh, there's quite a few reasons uh, why some people feel that migrating to Python 3 is, uh, I don't want to say controversial. Well, it's definitely controversial uh, in the sense that there's work that needs to be done to migrate to Python 3. And the question is essentially, is it worth it to do that work? So um, one of the main goals will be essentially just to understand uh, where these people are coming from, what that extra work is, and, uh, and then you can make your own decision as to whether or not it's worth it. So, um, a little bit of history. Uh, Python is 25 years old. Uh, you, you probably don't know that piece of information if you haven't heard it before. Um, so, Python, the language, has existed for about 25 years. Python 3 is around 5 years old. Uh, so, 3.0 was released about 5 years ago. Um, and if you kind of look at the opinions of the core developers on how long it would take for Python 3 to reach adoption, uh, the, the, the figure that's thrown around by people like uh, Nick Coughlin is about five years. Um, and uh, uh, I should mention, though, that um, Python 3.0 uh, is, is what Nick Coughlin calls uh, a false start, which basically means that uh, performance-wise, 3.0 was not anywhere near uh, what people needed to do actual work. So really, you have to measure from from 3.1, which is about three years old. Uh, and so from 3.1 until now is about three years. And uh, again, if you ask those same core developers, that would put us uh, three years through in a five-year process and uh, that we're essentially on time. So uh, essentially, what what's the claim is is that uh, the current landscape, uh, be it as it may, uh, would put us such that in two years from now, Python 3 would be the version of Python that everyone uses, much like uh, we're in this kind of transition transition stage now where it's kind of somewhere in between. Most people are using Python 2, uh, but planning for Python 3 and supporting Python 3, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So, so uh, some, some of that controversy uh, is, is definitely due to uh, the fact that right now there's extra work for everyone. Uh, essentially everyone writing Python code uh, is having to do extra work to write libraries and things like that in order to a, first of all, if you have an existing one, port it to Python 3, and B, plan for uh, Python 3, uh, which is going to change a little bit about how you write your, write your code. So we'll see that in a second. Um, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay? Good. Okay, so, um, so let, let's catch up for a minute. This isn't a talk about uh, migrating from 2.6 to 2.7, but uh, I'll throw out a couple of features that, uh, that changed from 2.6 to 2.7 for uh, two reasons, essentially. Number one, um, if you've been writing Python 2 code, uh, you probably have been writing code that runs on at least 2.6 and 2.7, which means that anything on this list is probably something that you haven't been using. Uh, so from now on, uh, if you're going to write uh, 2.6 and up code, like we'll talk about in a minute, uh, then again, stuff from this list probably still won't apply to you. But uh, we're, we're getting to the point where you can start thinking about uh, supporting 2.7 and up or like we'll talk about later, uh, some, some more interesting options. 
so, so, so we'll just breeze through this uh, a little bit quickly. The unit test module, uh, Python's standard library unit testing module, um, was, uh, it, it wasn't really rewritten, but uh, it grew a lot of nice new features. Uh, specifically, um, in Python 2, uh, 2.6, I should say, uh, the width is a little bit messed up here. Uh, okay, hopefully that won't bother us too much. Uh, but um, essentially, in Python 2, you have this kind of ugly looking assertion that you have to make any time that you want to assert that some function is going to raise an exception that you're expecting, uh, you, you, you obviously can't pass in a function call to your uh, to your assertion. So if you if you call that function and you expect it to return an exception and you expect it to raise an exception, you're going to have that exception before assert raises gets a chance to be called. So assert raises has this kind of ugly looking thing where you pass in a function, you pass in a bunch of arguments, a bunch of keyword arguments that you want assert raises assert raises to call for you, and then it makes its assertion based on what happened in that function call. So it's it's a little bit ugly. Um, unit test two uh, is much nicer. Uh, Although it doesn't look it because uh, index error is broken up, but but uh, essentially um, assert raises became a context manager. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about context managers later. I'd like to gauge a little bit about what what level uh, people are. So so maybe maybe now would be a good time to ask how many people in here uh, would say that they're proficient Python two developers. Okay, that's uh, about half, a little bit less than half. Uh, how how many people have? Uh, used Python 3 in production. Aha, that's a small number. It's zero. Uh, how many people? Uh, okay. Okay. So 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 um, okay. So we're good. So so basically, th this this form of assert raises uh, is just a. It's a little bit. It's a little bit clearer. It says it says more like what you what you mean. But uh, in 2.6. Uh, context managers existed, but this didn't for some one reason or another, uh, and so you had the ugly old thing. Um, so that's kind of nice. There, there's other things. There's a whole bunch of new assertions that Unit Test 2 has. Uh, some of them are good. Some of them are kind of stupid. But uh, it, it's, it's especially useful um, when you're writing when you're testing descriptors because if you're testing a descriptor, uh, you essentially have to write this ugly-looking assert raises uh, with you know, get adder, and then it's just nasty looking. Uh, so it, w with the context manager version, it's definitely a bit nicer. If I decrease the size, can you guys in the back still see? We have other monitors back here. So oh, yes. good. Okay. Great. So is that still okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, another thing is the arg parse module. Uh, Python has gone through scores of different modules for parsing or creating command line interfaces, there's get op, there's op parse, and then 2.7 had arg parse. Um, the reason why these two on this slide are kind of related is because both of these exist as backported modules. So if you're writing 2.6 code, uh, just drop them in. Uh, th there, there's no reason to really worry about this too much. If, you're, if you want, still want to support Python 2.6, you just depend on unit test 2, which is the name of the new unit test as it has been backported to Python 2.6. So you drop that into your requirements, and now you're New unit test two code runs on Python two point six. Same thing for arg parse. You download arg parse, uh, or you require it in your, you know, whatever library you're writing, and you're essentially good. Uh, a couple other, uh, essentially, uh, string formatting got a little nicer. You don't have to number the arguments that you have. Uh, subprocess that check output. Uh, it's a fairly common case that you wanna that you wanna run some subprocess and just see whatever it happened to write to standard out. Uh, and there wasn't actually a way or, or a single function that did that in Python 2.6. Uh, so for convenience, it exists in 2.7. It's not really a big deal if it doesn't exist. You just use the popen object and read from its standard out. So it just becomes three lines. But, but th this is kind of a theme in all these kind of changes, which is, you know, there's this kind of nice new interface, the subprocess module, and it covers most of the nice cases. Uh, but there's a couple that get, leave, that get left out, and then, you know, a version or two later, they get filled in, and it's not, it's not, you know, you, it's not a deal breaker if you didn't have them, but, but they're kind of nice to have, and so you, you kind of get used to them if you're, if you're writing code that depends on the newer versions, and get a little bit more frustrated if you have to go back and use something that doesn't happen. Uh, and then uh, context managers uh, were introduced in 2.5 and took all the way to 2.7 for things like 
uh, not the actual file. The actual file object is a contact manager, so you can write with open whatever as my file, and it will get automatically closed whenever the context manager is done. Uh, some of the other things in the standard library, which are also file-like objects, like the compression library objects, which wrap file objects, weren't actually context managers until 2.7. So you have this kind of feature propagation. It's another kind of theme that you have, which is that anytime that you move to a newer version, some of the features that were there in, in, in the old version need to kind of propagate out into the other parts of the standard library. Um, uh, and the last thing is there's, you know, literal syntax for sets and set comprehensions and dig comprehensions. Uh, that's not too exciting. Um, and the last thing, which I have never ever seen anyone use before, is, uh, is dig views. Uh, so like we'll talk about in a minute, essentially Python 2's, um, has two, Python 2.6 has two ways to access keys, values, and items from a dig. Uh, if you call the dot keys or dot values or dot items methods, you get back copied lists of the keys, values, or items. So you, you get a new list, it puts all the keys in there and creates a new object for you. Uh, when Python gained iterators, uh, the iter items and iter keys and iter values methods were added, which don't create new lists, they just yield out each keyword, uh, each key value or item as you go. Uh, in Python 3, both of those went away, and instead what you have are things called view objects, uh, which are you know, perfectly fine, they're, they're nice objects to work with, they're essentially um, views, so it's not a new object like a list that's uh, being allocated uh, with tons of new function pointers or uh, tons of new pointers or however else. But um, it's a, a set-like object, so you can you can you can interact between views and set objects. You can take their intersections, unions, things like that. Um, unfortunately, though, being that in Python 2, uh, dot keys was already taken and dot iter keys was you know, also already taken. Uh, a new name was created for them, which is dot view keys, view items, and view values. And because it's essentially 2.7 only, and it's the kind of feature that you only know exists if you know about Python 3 and you know you want to interact with sets, essentially I've never seen anyone ever use them before. Uh, but, but they're there and they're interesting and they're worth mentioning. Um, okay, so let's move on a little bit. So, so why, does, why, does, why does Python 3 exist? So essentially, Python 3 exists because somewhere along the line, uh, there was a decision made that Python 2 has mistakes. Um, mistakes, in this case, doesn't necessarily mean that you know somebody somebody messed up. We don't messed up. Uh, it, it could mean that some some of the things are in fact uh, things that it's kind of hard to see what somebody was thinking when they when they originally added them. Uh, the, the input function is a good example, uh, but uh, some of them are either accidents. Um, like the, the file module, the, the file class, so the, the class that represents the file object uh, in Python 2 has an exposed constructor. So in Python 2, the right way to open a file is you write open, you know, myfile.txt. Uh, unfortunately, somewhere along the line, the actual built in called file uh, became, for one reason or another, used to open files uh, unintentionally. So if, if you see people new to Python, they, they tend to get a little bit confused. Uh, they, you, you, they, you know, they've seen someone use the file, you know, they've seen someone call file on an object and that's how they assume you open a file. It kind of looks like the way you'd open a file. Uh, so, so some of those, you know, kind of accidental mistakes get fixed. Um, the other thing that, that um, Python 3 is aiming to uh, kind of improve upon is that, like I said, a lot of things that uh, didn't exist when Python the language was uh, created kind of evolved as the language um, moved forward. Uh, iterators are a good example of that. Um, Python didn't always have iterators. Uh, Python didn't always have generators. And so a lot of the functions, a lot of the built-in functions in Python, uh, and a lot of the standard library functions in Python return lists when they don't have to. Um, so the range function in Python 2 returns a list. There's not really any good reason why it should. And so somewhere along the line, they decided to say, okay, this is a good thing to have now that we have iterators, so let's add something called the xrange function. Um, but now that we're moving to Python 3, there's no reason to have two functions. Let's just make range be the thing that returns the iterator. Um, obviously, if it hasn't been clear up until now, Python has this kind of, uh, not unlike a lot of other languages, but perhaps more so, uh, slightly, slightly more so, Python, Python has this obsession with backwards compatibility. Uh, things 
generally shouldn't break, and old code generally, should, generally shouldn't break. So um, there, there wasn't a decision ever made in Python 2 to you know, do a release of Python 2 that breaks a whole bunch of code for, for no good reason other than these reasons that Python 3 is coming around for. Um, and so uh, th those, are, those are a couple of categories of things that Python 3 is aiming to improve upon. Um, other crazy things, uh, I'm sure some of you, uh, most of you probably get the reference uh, here for, you know, the, the complaint about, job, uh, about JS uh, exposing uh, itself a little bit here for, for uh, a bit of its weak typing. Um, we're, we're not that much better in Python 2 because uh, we, we also have our issues. Um, and this is a kind of crazy thing. Uh, the, the, the reason this exists is again for, for, for a similar reason uh, that Python did not always have the ability to have two objects that um, didn't know how to that one of them didn't know how to compare it to the other one. Uh, so so now if you if you write a comparison function in Python, basically the way that you do it is um, you compare you compare if you can to the other object, and if you can't, then you should be returning not implemented, which basically says I don't know how to compare to you, but give the other object a try, and if it knows how, then let it decide. Uh, and then if Python gets two not implemented, then you get your then you get your error. Um, but that, that didn't always exist. Uh, at one point in time, when, when comparisons uh, or, or when comparisons became overridable, um, there wasn't a way to do that. And so every object had to be comparable to every other object. And that means that in Python two, every object is comparable to every other, every other uh, object, unless that other ob every sorry every built-in object is comparable to every built-in object. If you're writing your own class, you're free to do whatever you want. Um, you, you don't have to implement comparison for every other object. But the built-in objects um, were cemented in as being comparable to every other built-in objects. Um, and so you get crazy things like this. Uh, and you get more crazy things. Uh, if you sit there and you try to figure out exactly, well, you don't have to figure it out, you can look it up. But uh, if you try to figure out how Python does these comparisons, essentially what it does is it alphabet alphabetically compares the type names. So that's why you get one is less than you know, zero, because one is an instance of int, and zero is an instance of string, and i is less than s, so there you go. So, look, uh, <laughs> uh, an another common thing is um, the standard libraries is a total mess in Python 2, uh, naming-wise. There's just, if you want to do things relating to URLs, or, you know, uh, parsing URLs, uh, making requests, forget about the fact that there's URL lib and URL lib 2, and go figure out, you know, that, that one's fairly obvious, because, you know, it's 2, so it's better, so everyone knows to use URL lib 2. But uh, there, there's just scattered functionality all over the standard library. If you want to parse URLs, there's a module called URL parse. What reason it got its own uh, namespace entirely is because, well, I don't know. Um, so, so if you want to, if you if you're looking for functionality, you essentially have to go hunt for it in the various uh, libraries that it may appear in. Um, Another thing is that uh, PEP8 is another thing that didn't always exist. PEP8 is the standard library style guide, uh, which, among other things, specifies how things should be named. Um, and that didn't always exist, so you'll find some kind of strangely named things in the standard library. The Q module, for some reason, uh, is capitalized. Config parser, for some reason, is capitalized. Um, there, there aren't really great reasons for some of those. Some of those are even after PEP8 existed, and there's not really any excuse for that. But essentially, yeah. Essentially, uh, it's a mess. So uh, things just needed to be moved around a little bit. But again, um, the fact that there's a URL parse module and it's not living in some URL name uh, in some larger URL package is not really a good reason to to say, okay, here, everyone who's writing Python two code, we're going to do a deprecation, so all your code is going to break because we want you to write URL dot instead of URL parse dot whatever. So that decision was made to be um, to, to to only be done once. Uh, there was a specific backwards incompatible release like Python 3. Um, but the main reason that Python 3 exists is not uh, for any of those things, although uh, fixing some of those things is definitely a nice benefit. The main reason why Python 3 uh, exists is because, again, another thing that didn't always exist in Python is Unicode support. Um, 
Python had Unicode support rather early on compared to some of the other uh, modern languages, uh, but it, it didn't always have it. Uh, and so the way that Python was forced to implement uh, the interaction between Unicode and Bytes objects is crazy. Um, what that means is, is that if you create a dict object like this uh, and uh, you know you stick a Unicode foo object uh, key in there and a, a Bytes bar object in there, uh, and then you come along and you say, okay, now give me the bytes object foo and the Unicode object bar, uh, you get your keys, uh, you, you get your values. Um, and if you think about what's, what's going on there, uh, it's essentially a symptom of what's going on in many places uh, where this type of thing happens, which is Python's implicitly encoding and decoding things for you. Uh, and that's, that's bad, uh, because uh, it's hiding places in your code where you've possibly made a mistake, probably made a mistake. Uh, and also because bytes and Unicode are not the same thing, so please don't mix them for me. Um, so, uh, it's not that great. Uh, it, it's, it's just really easy to find people having problems with this. I mean, you write this kind of simple function here uh, to, you know, to add together two strings, because, you know, why not? Uh, and then you, you, know, you, you sit there in a console and you're like, okay, uh, this, this thing totally works. I mean, I, I, I passed it two strings and it added them, so this totally works, put it in production. Uh, and then it, it just blows up, uh, because all of a sudden, uh, one of two things happen. Either uh, something that you expected to be bytes uh, ended up being Unicode, and now you added Unicode to some bytes, uh, but that by itself won't do it. Uh, what you need to happen is um, that you had something that wasn't ASCII, or something that wasn't UTF-8, or something that wasn't the implicit encoding that Python was using on your machine. Um, and so you'll, you'll find people with all kinds of uh, frustration at things like this. Uh, it, it's it's kind of compounded by the fact that, again, Python's doing implicit encoding and decoding for you, uh, which means that you can uh, theoretically call decode on an object uh, of which you assumed is one or the other. Uh, obviously, in that case, you assumed it was bytes. And Python can sometimes throw a Unicode encode error because it turned out to be Unicode, and then it converted it to bytes, and then it tried to convert it back, and it didn't know how. Uh, or sorry, on the encode step, it didn't know how. Uh, so, so you can get some crazy uh, error messages. Um, if you're not so comfortable with uh, Unicode and bytes, uh, again, uh, don't have time to talk about that, but, but uh, Ned Batchelder did a whole talk essentially on this one point. Uh, it's called Pragmatic Unicode, and you can uh, definitely go check that out. Uh, I, would, I would recommend it if, if you've bashed your head against your computer at one point or another because you've shotgun encoded, decoded until Python shut up. Uh, so so that's, that's definitely an issue. So that's kind of some of the, some of the motivation behind uh, the things that Python 3 is trying to fix. Uh, it's trying to re-separate Unicode and bytes, um, and remove some of the headaches that came along with that, uh, although perhaps introducing some new headaches. Uh, and it's also in the process uh, kind of culling away some of the stuff that's either unnecessary or improperly designed based on more modern uh, idioms that have entered the language, idioms or tools that have entered the language. Um, so let's talk about options now. So, so if you're somebody writing some new Python code, uh, what are your options essentially? Uh, well, the, the simplest option is you know writing something that's or writing something that's one or the other, either Python two only or Python three only. You don't have to worry about much um, compatibility between two technically incompatible versions of the language, uh, not backwards compatible versions of the language. So your maintenance burden is easier. Uh, your your code is going to be more uh, idiomatic for for the version that you're writing it in. Um, so. The, those are definitely uh, options. You can you can definitely decide to write some Python two only code uh, or Python three only code. Um, and yes, uh, it does bear saying that uh, in case you were wondering, Python two is not COBOL. There will be Python two code around in fifteen years from now, and people will not uh, really complain about maintaining it. Python two is a perfectly fine language, despite all the stuff that was mentioned before. Uh, it's perf people are writing Python 2 only code, uh, lots of people, uh, and, and the languages are just not 
uh, that different from each other. Um, so it, it's perfectly reasonable to choose one of those two options. Uh, it's not that exciting because essentially you've made your choice and now just go use all the tools that the version that you've chosen uh, offers you, but, but it, is, it is an option. Uh, Python 3 only is slightly less common. Uh, you, you, won't, you won't really find uh, very many libraries. I can't think of one off the top of my head uh, that's an actual library in wide use that's Python 3 only. Uh, there's a classifier on, the, on PyPy, the Python package in index for Python 3 only. Uh, I didn't check, but I'd be cur curious to see how many of those uh, libraries on the index actually list themselves as Python 3 only. You definitely will find libraries that are Python 2 only, um, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute or so. Um, but, but these are definitely two options. Uh, and uh, in case it also bears repeating again, Python 3 is definitely ready enough to be used as a language. So yes, even though nobody raised their hands that they have put Python 3 in production, uh, go for it. So you, Python 3 only is definitely uh, worthy of being on this list of potential options. Uh, the more exciting option is obviously, you know, support everything, uh, or something in between, that's, that's cool too. Uh, supporting everything is, is really, really hard, uh, and, and it's really not worth, not worth your headache. So when I say supporting everything, essentially, um, the earliest Python version you're going to find in the wild right now is probably uh, 2.4 on somebody's 10-year-old laptop or something like that. Um, so if you wanted to support everything from 2.4 to 3.3, be prepared for headaches and long nights drinking. Um, the more reasonable options is going to be, um, let's support 2. Point something to 3. Point something, uh, where 2. Point something uh, is more reasonably uh, something around 2.6 or so. So 2.6 and up is mostly what we'll focus on. Um, there's a couple of different strategies that you can pick for how exactly you want to structure your code base if you're going to do something like this, supporting versions of Python 2 and Python 3. Again, they're, they're not um, necessarily source compatible versions, so there is code that will run only on Python 2 and Python 3, which is part of the problem. And so you're going to have to pick some sort of option uh, to get code that runs on each version. Um, and there's a, a bunch of different options for that. Uh, very quickly, there's a tool called uh, 2 to 3, which is um, which is uh, essentially, uh, it's in the standard library, it's part of the standard library, it's distributed along with uh, the later versions of Python 2 and Python 3. It's, uh, it's a script that essentially tries to take your Python 2 code and do some of the trivial changes that are required to get it to run on Python 3. Uh, mostly dumb things like uh, print was a, was a statement in Python 2. Uh, it will add parentheses around all your print statements so that they turn into print, print function calls. Uh, it's reasonably smart, but uh, you still will require extensive uh, play in order to kind of make sure that that's a reasonable way to get your code to run on Python 3. It's, it's definitely not uh, a sure thing that, you know, I write some Python 2 code, I run 2 to 3, and it's magically Python 3. If that were true, then, well, we, we wouldn't have done a backwards incompatible release. Uh, we just would have ran 2 to 3. Um, there's a wrapper around it uh, called Python Modernize, uh, which is written by uh, Armin Runeher, um, which uh, kind of fixes some of the funny interactions between literals, between Python 2 and Python 3, which we'll get into a little bit more uh, in a minute. But uh, in, in Python 2, like we saw before, there's a, there's a U prefix that you, can, that you can use if you want a Unicode literal. So in Python 2, if you, if you put nothing in front of your string, you get a byte object, a byte, a, essentially a byte string. Uh, it's an instance of the class called str, str, uh, but it it holds bytes. Uh, in Python 3, if you write a prefixless prefixless string, you get an instance of the class called str. Unfortunately, the class called str in Python 3 is not bytes; it's Unicode now. Um, so there are prefixes for specifying exactly which type of string you would like. Uh, there's the u prefix. For specifying that you want a Unicode object uh, unambiguously, and there's the B prefix for specifying you want a bytes object. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that the U prefix was removed in Python 3, which means that you think that you have a way to specify something unambiguously between Python 2 and Python 3. Unfortunately, one of the headaches you'll run into 
is that there's no u prefix until 3.3. Uh, I was reintroduced in Python, Python 3.3 to make it slightly easier to port, um, but it is what it is. So modernize is there to kind of manage that uh, dissymmetry that there is uh, between which versions of Python 3 you can actually write those kind of literals in. So that's, uh, that, that'd be definitely one way. Uh, 3D2 is kind of the reverse. You write Python 3 code. It tries to magically convert it to Python 2 code. Uh, in theory, that's easier than writing Python 2 code and converting it to Python 3 code. Uh, it's a little bit harder to write 2 and uh, 2 to 3 is a little bit more complicated. In pra so, uh, in theory, 3 to 2 would be the way to go. In practice, though, um, both of these solutions aren't really uh, as popular as the third solution, which is having a single unified code base. Um, but out of the two of them, uh, 2 to 3 is definitely way more common than 3 to 2. Again, I, I can't think of a library that uses 3 to 2. Uh, and so, it's the road less traveled. Uh, you're on your own. If, uh, you're not on your own, but, but you know, buyer beware. So, uh, let's get into it. Um, if you want to write two code that runs on both versions, the immediate recommendation that I have for you, and it's not my own recommendation, you'll find uh, the same recommendation all over the place, is ignore everything that's less than Python 2.6 and ignore everything that's less than 3.1. If you don't do that, your life is going to be miserable. Uh, there are syntactic differences between um, 2.5 and Python 3 that are not fixable with anything like future imports. There's a future module uh, that kind of back um, pre-prepares you for later versions of Python. Uh, some of them don't exist in 2.5. So in 2.6 and up, including Python 3, uh, if you want to catch an exception and grab the actual exception object, um, you don't write except whatever comma thing. Uh, that syntax went away completely in Python 3. Uh, so this is a syntax error. Uh, you need to use the as keyword except whatever as something. Uh, and so Python 2.5 doesn't have the as keyword and therefore it doesn't have the syntax that works on Python 3. And so if you want to do this, it's more complicated. You have to import the sys module. You have to grab it out of exec info. And it's more complicated. Uh, you, you, you basically don't want to do this unless you're forced. Uh, if you're forced to support something less than 2.6, then uh, there's the 6 library, which kind of makes these things a little bit easier. Um, and and there, are, there are tools that will help your, help your life out. Um, in the past, the decision on what Python version your minimum version would be was probably decided by which Python versions you're likely to see in current versions of Linux or, you know, BSD or whatever else is lagging behind. Uh, the enterprise-y distributions like uh, Red Hat and, uh, you know, your favorite flavor of BSD that it likes to lag behind by however many versions. Uh, but as of right now, as far as I last recall, Red Hat ships 2.6, even in enterprise Linux, and uh, whichever CentOS uh, also is at 2.6, I think, at this point. So essentially everyone uh, that you're going to meet on a daily basis uh, for modern Linux distributions, even long-term support ones, are on at least 2.6. So this is, a, this is a safe thing at this point. Um, if you're going for a unified code base, uh, essentially the way to do so is to, to be clever. Uh, and being clever just means your goal in life is to write code without conditionals. Um, every time that you have to write the words, if Python 3 do something, otherwise do something else, it makes your life more complicated. So the goal is essentially to come up with a core set of compatibility, uh, a little tiny compatibility layer, uh, you know, cle clever ways to import modules, uh, clever ways to kind of navigate the changes between, you know, which methods you're calling and things like that. Uh, and so you kind of build up this, it, it, it's, it's like a kind of top-heavy way that all your modules end up starting up with, uh, start, starting off with. This, this is an actual excerpt from, from a module uh, that I maintain. Uh, this is the, the top of the module contains uh, this nastiness, but it definitely could be much worse. Um, and the types of things that you see here are, you know, the first three lines are navigating things that moved around. Um, you know, the URL parse module was a module by itself in Python 2. In Python 3, it got shoved inside the rest of the <coughs> URL of stuff. So you have to kind of be a little bit clever about um, how you import that. Uh, if you, if you need, for some reason, to access base string, uh, which please don't, but if you do, 
um, you know, that's a, that's a kind of easy way to make it exist on Python 3. It doesn't exist anymore. Base string was the old way to say um, Unicode or byte string in Python 2, and we don't need that anymore. Uh, and, and uh, you know, if you want to call iter items on a dictionary, uh, then you need to call iter items on Python 2, and you need to call items on Python 3, because there is no iter items. Uh, and so you can have uh, little method caller things there. Uh, I should note that one of the main things here is that it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, the URL parse module in Python 3 is not the same as the URL parse module in Python 2. There are new things in Python 3. Uh, I, I don't need them in this code base, and so I don't need to be any more clever than the minimum amount that requires my code to work. Uh, and, and that's that's a kind of common thing too, is that you're writing this, you, you know, you're, you're developing on your library and you're, you're implementing this new feature or fixing a bug or something like that. Uh, and there's this kind of break in the stream of consciousness of like, I want to get this bug out, I want to fix, I want to fix, I want to add this feature, I want to fix this bug, and uh, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, but you know, this this function that I need doesn't exist on X Y Z version of Python that I want to support, and that kind of you know breaks you for a second. You have to kind of go back up here and you know figure out what the best way is to proceed from there. Uh, it's not a huge problem because uh, in practice, I would recommend that you develop on a single version of Python and then use some of the tools that I'll mention later to make your life a little bit simpler to test things on, to make sure they work on both versions. So, it is what it is. Um, again, there's this kind of tension between people that are looking to move the language forward, and uh, Python 3 is the new version and we want everyone to, we want everyone to use it, uh, and between people who uh, essentially feel that I have working Python 2 code uh, and my, you know, there, there's not really any good reason for me to take code that works and put additional effort into it. Um, I'm not using any of those new features, or, uh, or more commonly, uh, the contention is that I need to support legacy systems. I have code deployed in production, or um, you know, my library is not meant for people who are jumping to Python 3 immediately. So. Um, there's a kind of tension there between people who are like, oh, well, you're holding up the language, uh, we, we, we want to move forward, we don't want this to be a debacle anymore, people discussing, people having talks like the one that we're having right now about whether, if, or when to move to Python 3, we just want it to go away. Uh, so th those people kind of, sometimes, um, though they're well-intentioned, some of them less well-intentioned than others, uh, will create additional headaches for people who uh, are just trying to say that they're trying not to do any extra work. Uh, the, the prime example of this uh, is opening up an old wound by now, which is uh, something like Arch. Uh, Arch Linux decided to be, decided to be really um, gung-ho about it. Uh, and they changed user bin Python to refer to Python 3. Uh, and there is zero good reason to do that. Um, all it does is break stuff. They went through a whole process to migrate, migrate everything in their package repositories so that the you know the um, shebang lines um, that originally referred to Python three now referred to Python. It was just a, a whole mess and a whole lot of unnecessary work, uh, and it means essentially that me, as somebody who sits in the IRC channel, which I forgot to plug at the beginning, but you should—that's uh, the single plug, plug that I will make tonight—that you should come to Hash Python. Um, it, you'll just find people coming in and being like, "This script doesn't work on my computer." And the reason for that is very simple, because it says user bin and Python at the top. And on everything besides Arch Linux, user bin and Python is a version of Python 2, and the user is using Arch. And it's just a thing that, it doesn't play out so much anymore, but it was definitely more common uh, back when the change was done. Uh, and it, it doesn't really provide any benefit to do something like that. In fact, uh, there's a pep which I don't think uh, was accepted or denied, uh, but there's a pep out there that basically says permanently keep user bin Python as a version of Python 2, and use Python 3 if you really, you know, use Python 3 as the way to invoke the binary if you really want to invoke Python 3, and there's, there's nothing whatsoever wrong with that. It's, it's a perfectly good solution, and there's no reason to break stuff. Uh, again, people are creating more work for no reason. Uh, there, there's no reason something like that has to exist. Not that I'm hitting on Arch, I happen to use Arch, but... Um, on the other hand, uh, it definitely is valid to say that, you know, it's, it's good for people to migrate to Python 3, we want people to migrate to Python 3. Uh, there are nice things in Python 3. Uh, I will eventually get to discussing some of them. Um, and so, 
Um, it, it's a fight backwards and forwards. I heard actually recently, uh, I saw a tweet. I saw a tweet basically that said uh, uh, that Sublime Text 3, I'm not sure how many of you use Sublime Text, uh, but apparently Sublime Text 3 is dropping support for Python 2. Again, that, that, that's, it's, I, I can understand for people who are users of a text editor that is dropping support for the language that they probably still write for their day job uh, as being frustrating. Uh, it, it's just a cause for extra work. It's um, a module system that's been the, Yeah, I'm sorry. The modules, yeah, of course you can still write whatever the heck you want in your text editor. But yeah, the module system is being changed. Um, so, who specifically is lagging behind? Uh, if, you, if you looked at um, the links, or I'm sure most of you have probably seen it before, uh, the links to the, uh, in the meetup description, one of them was for the Wall of Shame, aka Wall of Superpowers. Um, it, it's, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that before. Uh, it's essentially a giant list of what things support Python 3, what things uh, say they will only support Python 2, um, and it's a, a kind of a metric to see where, where we are. And uh, I think about now, it's, uh, so it's a, a list of the top 500, I think, packages uh, in the index and which of them support Python 3. Uh, I think it's around 60% or so now uh, that support Python 3 on that list of top 500. Uh, but that number is misleading. Um, there's an official, more official uh, list maintained by one of the core developers uh, that kind of fixes some of the problems with the wall of superpowers. Uh, but, but mostly the reason why that number is misleading is because a lot of the things that aren't or haven't been ported yet are interdependent. Uh, if your thing depends on gevent, gevent doesn't support Python 3, and so therefore your thing doesn't depend on Python 3. And so if both of you are in the top 500, well, you're not moving until gevent does. So that number is a bit deflated. Um, or it's not deflated, but it's a bit misleading. Uh, people are waiting on libraries that are slightly more complicated to port. Uh, and so which are those libraries, or, or who are the people that are essentially lagging behind uh, in the porting uh, to Python 3? The, the top uh, spot on this list goes to people uh, or groups that develop alternative implementations of Python. Uh, Jython, which is Python that runs on the JVM, is just releasing or has just released 2.7 beta 1. So there is not an existing version of Jython that runs on Python 2.7 yet. Uh, it's just being released. Python 2.7 is quite old by now. Um, but if you're, right, if you're uh, maintaining or writing an alternate, alternate implementation of Python, uh, you're, you're, you're behind. I mean, the, the other implementations definitely do not have uh, as good or as good or or as complete or complete at all solutions for Python three. Um, this isn't a talk about PyPy either, but uh, if I don't mention it at least once, I think uh, they're going to throw things at me. Uh, the language is kind of moving in these two uh, somewhat independent directions, though they eventually meet, which is uh, PyPy opening up all these new uh, possibilities places that you know you, you couldn't originally use Python but now you can, uh, places where uh, you could use Python but uh, you had to call out to some faster, more lower level language, and PyPy Pi is basically opening, opening up a lot of those possibilities. Uh, and so for a lot of people, uh, and I'll, I'll say at this point myself included, the more exciting uh, future of Python uh, lies with them than with uh, standard library improvements. Uh, standard library improvements are nice, uh, and I want them, and I do want to move to Python 3, uh, and I do think you should move to Python 3, and I do think Python 3 will succeed, and, uh, and it'll be great, and five years from now we probably won't be talking about this, uh, but, but the more exciting things to be talking about are not necessarily some of these things. So it's a reality that um, we needed to do, or Python needed to do some of these changes, and some of it causes some extra work. Uh, but that work will get done, and eventually we'll get over it, and we'll have a better, slightly better language, um, and then we can talk about more exciting things. Uh, so if you're if you're the author of a of an alternative implementation, you're you've had a hard time keeping up until now. So having a backwards incompatible language uh, was just extra on top of your plate. Uh, they, they were obviously consulted, uh, 
in the development process. There was no unilateral decision here. Uh, this whole thing was well discussed, uh, but it's a reality that they're lagging behind. Uh, there was a language moratorium before 3.3 was released, which is the most recent version, uh, which feature froze uh, a lot of the standard libraries. So that, that, that kind of helped a little bit um, for them to catch up. Uh, but, but they're still behind. Uh, PyPy has uh, three, Python 3 support in the works. Uh, it's not even half done, I don't think. Um, so that, that'll take time. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure most of you who, who use alternative implementations know reasons to, you know, to do what you're doing, uh, which is either you need to interact with some other language uh, like Java and, and you want to have Python running on the JVM, or you, you know, Stackless or Iron Python or all these other implementations uh, that have their own nice uses. Um, the next group of uh, packages on that list slash uh, groups that are lagging behind is people writing networking code. Uh, and I, I'm not talking about you know, people doing web requests, uh, but people writing uh, low level or slightly above the socket level uh, network, networking code, uh, people writing um, you know, the WSGI spec, uh, people writing WSGI servers. Uh, these people also uh, have headaches. Uh, and essentially the reason for that is that um, we separated bytes in Unicode, and for everybody that's pretty great, except for people who write networking code, uh, where when you write networking code, um, lots of the time you basically do have a crazy mangled thing where some stuff is stuff in an encoding that you do know about, and some stuff is just arbitrary bytes, and you need to squash them together, A, and B, uh, you need to do um, kinds of manipulations on bytes uh, something like what you would use uh, string that format in Python 2 to you know take uh, you know you have an integer and you want to format it a certain way or you have a float and you want to format it a certain way and interpolate it into a string without making too many temporary copies or things like that um, and in Python 2 that was totally fine because uh, the stir type which was bytes in Python 2 had a format method and uh, and so you can call that format method and have your interpolation being done at the essentially the C level. Uh, in Python 3, it's gone. Uh, bytes don't have a format method anymore uh, because for everyone else besides people writing networking code, you don't format bytes. Uh, you, you format text and then you encode it at some point to bytes. Uh, but if you're writing networking code, you do format bytes and the fact that there is no format method makes your life difficult. Uh, especially given what we've mentioned before that you want to write code that uh, is the same source for Python 2 and Python 3 and just have it do the right thing on each of the versions, and it's, it's harder to do that uh, when you have bytes on both versions, but one of them has a format method and one of them doesn't. It's, it means that your <coughs> Python 3 code is going to get significantly slower. Um, there are other things that make networking uh, code uh, more difficult. Uh, the, 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 when, when the switch was done from uh, this kind of mangled world of bytes and units combined <coughs> to the more separate world in Python 3, uh, all these decisions had to be made as to what things would be bytes and what things would be Unicode. Uh, and so, for example, the WSGI spec, uh, which was PEP333 in Python 2, uh, became PEP3333 in Python 3 because now all these new decisions had to be made uh, as to uh, which, you know, which type should all these keys be and all these values be and uh, w what types do we want to put everywhere. Should these things be Unicode values, should they be bytes values, uh, and all the considerations that come with making that decision. Uh, and in fact, uh, 3.2 was the first version of Python that shipped with the WSGI ref module, which is Python's, the, the standard library's implementation of the WSGI spec. Uh, and so that, that gives you a kind of idea of how far behind that sector is. Uh, 3.2 is not that, not that long ago. It's, it was released alongside Python 2.7. But uh, it's, it's just been since then uh, that there's been a, a WSGI server implementation or the start thereof in the, in the standard library. Um, if you write large frameworks, you're, you're probably behind because you're behind because you have a large framework. But, uh, but it, lots of the changes that you're making for Python 3 are these large T, uh, are these very small uh, mechanical changes, you know, putting prefixes before literals, uh, calling in code or decode in certain places, uh, you know, changing your print statements. All these mechanical changes. It would be nice if you would be able to just, you know, grep and save your entire, uh, your entire uh, library. Uh, unfortunately, that is not really a great way to, a great way to make sure that um, 
you actually have a working thing when you're done. Uh, of course, this is even given that your large framework has a well-covered uh, test suite. Um, if you look at uh, essentially any large framework, uh, the move to Python 3, A, introduces bugs for Python 2 code that you've now modified, despite the fact that it was mature and relatively bug-free as far as you knew up until then. You're reintroducing headaches. Uh, and then you need, you need, you need testing for, for the new stuff or for any new stuff that you've written for Python 3. So people writing large frameworks um, also takes longer. That's not to say that uh, large frameworks haven't moved to Python 3. Uh, things like NumPy and SciPy definitely, uh, they, they moved to Python, uh, ported to Python 3 uh, quite a while now uh, ago. Um, but things like Twisted and Gevent and uh, WX Python uh, these, these large frameworks uh, have a harder time. Uh, and the last group, uh, well, people who are backward compatible conscious, uh, where that means, for example, Twisted's deprecation policy basically says the following, never deprecate anything unless it's immediately inter, uh, stopping you from maintaining or making your life more difficult writing your new thing. Um, essentially, the deprecation policy they have is why remove deprecated code? It doesn't gain you any benefit unless it's bothering you as a maintainer at this exact moment and you have a reason to remove it. Uh, th this is code that runs on you know, corporate systems and legacy systems and tons of things like that. So if you're backwards compatible conscious, uh, again, supporting things from 2.4 and up is, is uh, essentially help. Uh, coverage, coverage.py and virtual env are both two examples of modules that do support 2.4 and up. Uh, and if you talk to their maintainers, uh, they're a bit uh, baddie due to it. Uh, let's uh, talk one specific example uh, in the remaining time that we have and then we'll cover a little bit of the uh, new features just to leave ourselves off on a good note. Um, so let's talk about the tragic tale of TCP. Uh, this module is uh, the module that tests the implementation of TCP in Twisted. Um, if you run the test suite on this module in Python 2, uh, it turns for a little bit and then it tells you that it ran 36 tests in 0.875 seconds. If you run this uh, test module on Python 3, then you get uh, it ran 36 tests in 38 seconds. Uh, that's a significant change. Uh, and, and this module is not, it, this test module is, is doing fairly uh, reasonable things. It's, it's not doing, it, it, it's not, it's essentially using twisted, uh, it's essentially using TCP the way that you would if you were uh, somebody using TCP. It's not, it's not doing anything more complicated than that. Uh, and if you investigate why uh, you got a, what is it, 50 time uh, slowdown, uh, it comes down to stupid things. Uh, essentially the reason why you have this kind of slowdown is because in Python 2, there was the buffer object, which I would be fairly confident no one in this room has used. Has anyone used the buffer object before? One person. Okay, that's good. That's above average. Um, the buffer object, if you don't know what it is, uh, I always forget, uh, is, it's, it's basically a read-only view um, of an object. Uh, so there's a buffer interface. It gives you read-only views of certain kinds of objects that implement the buffer interface in Python 2. So for example, a string, if you're looking for a read-only copy of a string and you don't want to deal with additional copies of the string, um, you, you, you wrap it in a buffer object on the substring that you're actually looking at uh, and then later maybe come back and uh, extend that buffer object and uh, avoid doing an additional copy of the string um, or additional copies as the case may be. If you're, if you're writing a TCP implementation and you have this buffer, I'm talking now about a TCP buffer that's buffering incoming data, uh, then that, that's something that not, doesn't just happen once, it happens many times for each time that you add to the buffer, get stuff out of the buffer. So there's a lot of extra string operations that are going on there. Uh, and so that's essentially what, what's going on here. Uh, in Python 3, there is no more buffer. Uh, buffer is gone. Uh, there is a way to get read-only views of objects in Python 3. It's called memory view. Uh, and it would be nice uh, if like we had before, you would be able to just drop it in and do and have code that runs exactly the same way on Python 3 as in Python 2 because, again, the, uh, the thing that we're looking for is to have code that runs exactly the same way, just with a little bit more clever on top. Uh, unfortunately, it has slightly different behavior 
Uh, when you say take a memory view object and you add some bytes to it, you don't get back a memory view object. Uh, if you take a buffer object in Python 2 and you add some bytes to it, you get back a buffer object. Uh, so it doesn't work the same, and so you can't use it, and so you have to do regular string operations, and so you're 50 times slower. Uh, it's not something that can't be fixed. It can be fixed, of course. It can be fixed by adding that additional complexity of do this if you're on Python 3, do this if you're on Python 2, and since no one has done it, if you wanted to use TCP on Twisted, you're essentially 50 times slower than you would be on Python 2. So there's extra work there. Uh, moving a little bit more quickly, um, there's a bytes object in Python 2 that gives you some bytes. Uh, if you give it an integer, uh, it takes that integer and it gives you back bytes, the byte representation of that integer. So you give it 14, it gives you the bytes containing the ASCII characters 1 and 4. Uh, if you call the same function on Python 3 with 14, you get a whole bunch of null bytes. For what reason, I have no idea. Uh, from what I'm told, I'm, I'm not someone who writes tons of uh, low-level networking code. This is not something that you ever do, essentially. It's, it's, not, it's not a useful operation, especially not to have as the default constructor. Uh, if it was a class method, it would be perfectly reasonable. But to have it do this is, again, uh, you have this object. It does something on Python 2. It does something different on Python 3. Uh, go for it. You, you, you need to write that additional code that um, does the right thing on each one. Okay, now uh, that we're done with all the messy stuff, uh, there's three quick features that I will mention to leave a good taste in your mouth about things that are coming in, uh, or have come in Python 3, uh, and things to look forward to. Uh, how many people have ever written code that kind of looks like this? Uh, you you, you want to process a file, and of course, uh, the nice idiomatic thing to do is to not handle resources yourself. You get them passed in from others. Uh, you don't touch them, you worry about the caller. The caller is responsible for you know, closing them or handling them or whatever else. Uh, and so, so you have this function, you want to process a file, uh, and so you're accepting a file object, um, but uh, there's also some reasonable default that you can do. So if no file object is provided, uh, there's a reasonable way or a specific file that you can go look at and say, okay, this is the default file, let me go grab that one. Uh, and so you write a function like this, it takes a file, and if you don't get one, you go get the default one. In that case, it now becomes your responsibility to clean up for yourself uh, with that file object that you've gone and retrieved. And so in Python 2, the only way to do that is essentially you set a flag and check it again later. Um, the, the, the second example here is, is a similar thing. Uh, you, perform some you perform some operation, and then if you got the result that you needed, then you, know, then you don't need some cleanup. So that it's, a, it's a, an equivalent uh, case here. But, but you basically use a flag, and then if the flag is, ends up being some Boolean true value, um, then, you, then you do your cleanup, which in this case maybe is closing the file or whatever else. Uh, it's kind of ugly. Uh, the reason context managers exist is to clean up a little bit of this flags and you know, needing, to do, needing to do cleanup uh, explicitly with a try finally. And so one of the things that's uh, kind of nice in Python 3.3 is a thing called contextlib.exit stack. Uh, raise your hands if you've ever used anything in the contextlib module. Okay, not that many. There's not very many things in there uh, that are useful. Uh, this is a nice one. Um, exit stack basically takes code that looks like this and makes it look more like this. Um, you write with create a new exit stack object, and then uh, if file is none, you didn't get a file, you open your file and then add it to the exit stack, and the exit stack makes sure to pop everything off of itself and clean it up uh, when it's exited. So this, this code does essentially exactly the same as what we had before, just without all the crazy flags, uh, and it works whether or not you have a file or not. Um, it's kind of nice. Uh, I'm not sure I expect tons of people to be using it a couple of years from now, not because it's not useful. Uh, it is useful uh, for, for things like this, but because uh, there are these standard library things that are useful, but either slightly oddly named or slightly obscure, like iterTools.groupBy, which is a really useful function, but almost no one uses because they don't understand it or they couldn't tell you what it does off the top of their heads. Uh, and so there's a sort of danger that something similar will happen here, but if you, if you know that it's there and you know the kind of things that it lets you do, it lets you enter uh, multiple uh, arbitrary numbers of context managers, uh, which you could do in Python 2, but in a totally broken way using something in the context lib module that is replaced by this. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, last couple of things. Exceptions. Uh, 
how many people have written code that looks like this that properly <coughs> used the error, num the error number module to check and make sure that if you're opening a file and it doesn't exist, that you only catch the <coughs> error number that corresponds to eno entry, uh, meaning the file wasn't there. Uh, most people don't don't do that. Uh, most people just you know accept IO error and then leave it uh, and catch every IO error that you possibly could have, which catches every IO error that you possibly could have, uh, which probably wasn't what you meant. Uh, this is the right way to do it in Python 2, um, but people are lazy. And so in Python 3, uh, the exception hierarchy was uh, reworked a little bit, so you can just write file not found error, and that's essentially equivalent to checking the error known. Um, there's a couple other nice things that changed about the exceptions uh, in Python 3. There's things like exception chaining, which is a thing that's uh, worth getting excited about. Uh, exception chaining means that if you get an exception, and then while you're processing that exception, you get another exception, Python 3 saves both and shows you both exceptions. In Python 2, you just get the later one. Um, so that, that's helpful. Uh, that, that is a thing that's helpful when you're debugging or things like that. Uh, uh, the last few things, there's parameterized tests that are coming. This is something that hopefully is coming in 3.4. It's not in 3.3, uh, but some tests are kind of somewhere in the middle of being parameterized tests and being some new thing. Uh, they're basically a way of having a whole bunch of independently failable uh, tests, which is a good thing. This isn't a talk about testing, but maybe it could be. Uh, and then optional subparsers. Uh, this is something having to do with the arg parse library. Also, it's something that hopefully will make it in 3.4. If you're writing some command line interface, sometimes you have a subparser like uh, git uh, log, which is a command, and then it gets a whole bunch of arguments. But sometimes you also have something that you want to have without a subparser, so you just say git and some options, and you want it to do something. Um, and you can't do that right now with the subprocess module, and it's also not that pleasant to add it on top of the subprocess module as is. And so that's something nice that we'll have. That's all I got. Thanks. All right, and so we're going to, uh, if anyone has any questions, we'll do go through the questions and then we'll do the book giveaway and then the uh, certificate giveaways. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, let's go right here. I hope it hope really so, um, so, so I looked at uh, converting between two and three a while ago, right? And then, I, then before this talk, I looked at it again and said, oh, it's gotten a lot better. Um, and, and, and of course, it sounds to me like what What's going on is it got between three and two, and more stuff has been added to two seven, and, and more, yeah, there's been a more conscious effort to try to make it more seamless. You know? and, then, and then you said, and you said, we talked about the stragglers, and you say, well, okay, they're having a hard time, you know, uh, uh, two to three, and, and it also sounds like uh, if, if you're like Jicon or you know, they're, they're concerned with performance, and they're, I guess, they're also probably worried about the fact that when they go to three. There's going to be performance, hit, right? Is, is, are they? Is, so I, I'm assuming that they're probably not going to try to even go to three one three two. Oh no, absolutely not. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I think every. I'm not sure what Jython is uh, aiming for, but uh, last I remember, PyPy was aiming to go straight to three point three. Yeah, I thought Jython was still trying to get to two six. Yeah. They're definitely, <laughs> they're definitely still trying to get done with the two two point X series, well, but so when they do move. So, how, how, so could you show the, the other list, PyPy, and, and of other and implementations? Yeah. yeah what, what other implementations? Do you so, Jython is Python on the JVM. Uh, their last release is 2.7 beta one. So they're about to do a 2.7 release. After that, uh, I don't know if they have. I don't use Jython. I'm uh, not 100% sure, but I would assume that they do have some plan for what they're going to do about supporting a Python 3 version. And I would assume that they're going to jump straight to 3.3. There's not really any reason to support the older versions. Uh, other implementations, there's, stack, there's uh, Iron Python, which runs on .NET. Uh, they also, I think they, they have a 2.7 release, uh, and I think they're also aiming for uh, free compatibility at some point in the reasonable future. Uh, PyPy is going straight to 3.3. Uh, there's Stackless, which is you know Python with tail recursion and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Uh, I don't know what their status is. Uh, and uh, there's probably a bunch of common implementations that I'm forgetting off the top of my head at this exact moment. Questions? Does anyone have any uh, experience in their own going from two to three? Yeah, that'd be good. No one thought. Uh, no. 
two. You're going from three to two. Are you, ma are you maintaining a library that needs to go back? Is this an uh, internal thing? No, I started working on a project and all the libraries that need to are carried three. Oh, is, okay. Is this, is this are, have you just started with Python? Just started. Yeah, that, that, that's a really common thing. Uh, people who uh, are new to the language and get confused by the fact that the version number is higher, so I should start with that. When it's much easier to get support and uh, tutorials and things like that on Python 2. There are materials, I think the books that we're giving away uh, have Python 3 materials in them. But it, it's just a fact of life that if you come into the IRC channel and you ask a question that's Python 3 specific, I tell you uh, I know less about Python 3 than I do about Python 2. So you are eliminating uh, me as potentially being able to help you. Uh, I, there, there are differences, and being that it's more things to know, there are fewer people that fewer people that know them at this point. Let, let me before we question. Let me ask uh, everyone else too, to everyone else from here who might use Python um, for your work or for your personal things. Uh, maybe raise your hands. Do you use Python for scientific computing, sort of big data kind of things? Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, web work. Anyone? Uh, networking. Okay. Um, uh, what was the, uh, uh, I had another category, my uh, systems administration, okay, a few here and there, actually it's a, a good portion here, and uh, I don't want to shut any categories I might have missed. Hobbies. Hobbies. Hobbies, learn, Hobbies. Which, build systems, build systems <laughs> okay, uh, automation, Scones. Scones. oh uh, yeah, that's entirely different than I was thinking, so, so maybe, do you have any thoughts about those areas or other areas that, that maybe three is a good fit for? Um, if, if you're doing... Uh, definitely scientific computing. Like you're, you're, you're probably not interacting with the Python landscape very much, uh, and, and you know NumPy exists and SciPy exists, and these other libraries generally exist on Python three uh, because they also don't generally interact with the environment that much. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it again in case it needs repeating. But if you, uh, if all of your dependencies and all of your foreseeable dependencies exist on Python three, it's a perfectly reasonable choice to make for going Python 3 only. So yeah, if you're, if you're in scientific computing, I can imagine that being an easy decision. Um, okay, so here will be well. Here. Oh, I just wanted to follow up that um, I work at NYU, so I happen to know that their intro CS classes use the 3 series. And on some of our lab machines, we don't even have like a 2.7 installed. So I'm going to install that to get like more than any. Um, oh, are you teaching class? I work in data services, so sort of. So there's are installations that have had any Python 2 removed currently? Yeah, so our machines have actually, for some reason, two versions of Python 3. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, was, it was like that, I'll mention, at CUNY as well. Uh, I went to CUNY in Baruch, uh, and uh, they started teaching a Python class while I was attending, uh, and it also, they, they, uh, they installed Python 3 originally, and then about a week into the class decided, oh, we, we want to do Python 2. Yeah. All right, so here. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Sure. Um, I, I work in a very small finance shop, and uh, my manager is very entrepreneurial. He built like a high yield aquatic system using a lot of Perl, a whole bunch of stuff like 10 years ago and sold it. And now he's looking to do some work in Python. And you know, we were discussing just the other day, 2.7 or 3, whatever. I mean, we don't deal with anything, you know, we're pretty, pretty self-contained, so to speak. So would that apply to your scientific meeting? Computing comment earlier where you go to three and be fine. Um, it, it it depends on the specific project. It always does. Uh, you you really need to look at the wide spectrum of features slash uh, implementation details that you're going to have to deal with and check out if the libraries that you're going to potentially need to use um, support Python three. I'll be the naysayer. Here. I'd say you want to stick with two seven because. Of want to pull in a random package, you're, you're going to have more chances of getting it at this point, just like you yeah. were saying about help in the IRC channel. What are your options for like, multi-threading high concurrency services? Like Python 2 is pretty limited, like GMAN twisted or you know, even loop based. <coughs> How about 3? Um, what are the options? Given that these libraries have imported into Python 3, is that, is that what's motivating your question? Uh, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is that uh, probably the main uh, large discussion going on right now on the Python Ideas mailing list relates to uh, adding an event loop interface to the standard library, codename Tulip. 
uh, coming to a theater near you, hopefully in 3.4. Uh, and, and the motivation for something like that is, is basically A, that having something like an event loop in a standard library is, is a cool, cool idea, uh, and B, that having something in a standard library which is an event loop would help all these libraries um, shift away from all the stuff that they have and onto uh, new core that's built into the standard library uh, that they can build off of. So if that lands in 3.4, which Guido seems highly motivated to make happen, uh, your life will get much easier when it comes to high concurrency. More questions? What's the timeline 3.4? Timeline for 3.4. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think that an alpha has even been released yet, so it's it's a ways off. A uh, I think probably a year. Yeah, a year is a good guess. Yeah, it's definitely been decided already. I just don't know off the top of my head. There's a pep that they want to do more more frequent releases, but not more frequent dot releases. So, recently yeah. so, for the GNU tools for GDB and GCC, they are using like Python and pretty printers and all kinds of stuff. Pretty printers? Yeah. So, what is the motivation behind for the GCC using Python or GDB using Python? I don't. I can't speak to their motivations, but I mean. Their motivations probably relate to the fact that it's it's just a simple, nice, you know, thing to get stuff done, and I can't I can't say I know any more than that. Are you talking about just the, the use of Python as an extension language, or are you also talking about the ability for GDB to show you the stack from uh, code down to the C library using exactly. Python? Uh, yes. What is recent discussion is happening is they are adding the Python plugins while the GCC itself is compiling, so you can't track the data because when GCC is actually oh, doing nice. some job, and that's how Python is embedded as a plugin, so you can put your plugin so that you can collect the data when it is doing its process. That's nice. And JD is also doing the same. So. That's nice. I haven't heard about that. Uh, there was another question, was there? Ah, over here. Charles, I want to come back to, you, you asked about different uses, and one one thing uh, I've noticed in the two to three that I didn't see was uh, import doc, you know, import doc. Uh, when I run two to three, I, I get that, and, and then I get errors from that. My, my specific use, you know, you talked about um, why would people write in three that not, not come back. So, so I've actually I've written two debuggers for Python. Um, cool. Which ones? Uh, PYDB. Okay. Well, that, that's really a, a rewrite of PDB, okay. uh, or, or an extension of PDB. Mm -hmm. so, and then there's another one called, and it's a horrible name, PYDB. Okay. But you had uses for them. What? But you had uses for them. Yeah, cool. Uh, right? Yeah. But, but there's a thing, but one of the, one of the big problems when you start to read, this is getting down to the point of experiences uh, in conversions and stuff like that. One of the big problems I had with the with that PYB DBGR. And in, in the Ruby and Perl world, is called Trapani. Uh, so, so that uh, well, is, and this is a big difference between two and, two and three, and also something I didn't even hear here. Uh, Ruby has something called require relative. Mm -hmm. Okay, Python has this weird thing of, of files. You, you can have a main file or a module, right? And then three, there's, a, there's the loader that there's a, there's a writable loader. And one of the mistakes I sort of made in the two series there was to try to, to, try to do that, to write that uh, a require relative kind of mm -hmm. uh, module. So I probably want to go to three. So one of the reasons I'll have three code that's not two is first of all, I want to make, make use of whatever, that, whatever changes in the runtime and cool features that might, might appear there. And then secondly, in order to get the require relatives. Yeah. But what about that? Uh, the dot. So, so are you referring to, referring to um, I'll be 100% 100, 100 honest with you. I use absolute imports always. Uh, I think they're better. Uh, but one of the things that were removed are implicit relative imports. Uh, so you, you can't implicitly import relative stuff anymore. I'm not sure if that covered the dot. I think that was removed separately, and I don't remember the reason for that. Um, but implicit relative imports went away. So if you have a package, and it has two modules in there, uh, toys.py and uh, fun.py, and in toys you do import fun. Um, it, in Python 2, in versions earlier than 2.6, uh, you get an implicit relative import and it imports your sibling. Uh, and everything after that, thankfully, it does not, it first searches the absolute uh, path first. So if there's a global module called fun, you get that instead. 
Uh, if you do it the other way, you essentially have no way to access the global modules without poking at the <coughs> important terminals. So yeah, there's, there's things that have changed about the import system. Import lib uh, is a pure Python implementation that made its way into 3.3. Um, it's a pure Python implementation of the import system. Uh, and that makes impl imp implementers' life easier. Uh, people like PyPy and all these places, um, all, all these other implementations, now get the ability to just use the actual import implementation present in C Python. Uh, so that, that helps them. Help that. All right, so I'm going to cut off the questions, or we're going to go to the uh, the book giveaways. So we have uh, we count just to make sure we have all three here: three uh, ebooks and two um, Bibles. And what we're going to do is um, five uh, five questions will be asked based on the presentation. Um, as each person answers, they can choose which one of these they want. Okay, and whenever you're ready. Okay, let's see what we got here. Uh, okay, most of these are soft folks. We'll see how they go. Uh, name a uh, built-in that has disappeared in Python 3. I saw this hand first. The U. Uh, the U? Oh, how lenient are we going to be here? You uh, decide. Okay, here, let, let, let me clarify. A, a built-in function that has disappeared in Python 3. You want to give him another shot before we move on? Do you want to do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, Hannah, we have a ringer back here. Base string, X string, base string, X string. Yeah, yeah, come, come grab some. <laughs> okay. Come on up. Uh, here, here's, a, here's a slightly more touchy question. Name something that Python 3 makes more difficult than Python 2. And I don't want your opinion. No, no second. <laughs> here, here you go. Networking. Uh, networking, okay. That's, that's, that's more from the nice presentation. Package, but yeah. Yeah. Alright. Um, name a strategy for porting uh, from Python 2 to Python 3 and an advantage that it has over another one. Hands. Any hands? No hands? Okay, we, we had a hand right here. Uh, 2 to 3, it's automatic. There you go. <laughs> you, you have a, a choice of which piece of paper you might want. There you go. Uh, oh, you keep, keep on. Yeah. Uh, name a, a module that moved in Python 3. Uh, URL parse. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't know. No, that, that, that's fine. Yeah? Cool. I, I mean, I'm not going to run back. URL parse? Yeah, that's good. All right, come on up, grab the uh, certificate. Uh, and, and name a tool uh, other than 2 to 3 that's designed to make porting from Python 2 to Python 3 easier, other than 3 to 2. I saw you in the Six, yeah, six. 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 All right. Good. That's Thanks all the giveaways. Um, thank you very much. We'll be going to to McKenna's after this. So, uh, like, people will be meeting groups out there. Round of applause, everyone.